our guest speaker for today's Music Entrepreneurship Departmental, Mr. Bruce Broughton, who's our guest composer in residence for our academic year this year. This is his second visit to our departmental. He was with us last fall. How many of you were in the class last fall? Oh, okay, cool. Some of you were still here. So this is part two. And for those of you who are coming to this class for the first time, and welcome to all our composers. We're thrilled to have you also join us today. Um, we're going to try and cover, he's going to go over a few topics that um, he's prepared, but also we want to make this a conversation and allow ample opportunity for you all to ask questions to make this as relevant as possible to your curiosities and what you're looking for. So I think we can also, as, we, as he's talking about different things, if you have a question, I don't think we need to wait till the end to ask it. We can make it kind of like interactive, so feel free to raise your hand and just if something comes up that, for something that uh, he's talking about, feel free to just interrupt him and, and we'll just go from there. I think we make it very lively that way. So thank you so much for joining us. So here's the thing. I get here and I'm the composer in residence, right? And I've got a long list of credits and things that I've done, some of which you know about, some of which you don't. Um, and I'm 20, 30, 40, 50 years older than a lot of you. Uh, and so here I am, a composer at the end of his career, not at the beginning of his career. I've actually had some people ask me, uh, are you retired? And I bristle at that because I don't think of myself as being retired. In fact, I know I'm not. Uh, one of the funny things about getting older is that you never feel like you're getting older. So inside, there isn't much difference between the way I feel and the way you feel. <clears throat> but in terms of uh, our careers, it's very, very, very different because you're all at the beginning and, and as I said, I've, I've had lots of years of doing this stuff. Um, so why am I not retired? I'm not retired because I'm grumpy. Um, I still have things to do. There's still things I want to do. The stuff that I used to do I, when I did a lot of television and film, I don't do so much of that any longer. Um, but I don't like sitting at home and I don't like thinking that um, just because somebody hasn't called me to write a TV show that I'm therefore not going to be a composer anymore. So I like to compose. I like to, to write music. Um, in that, I like to have people listen to the music that I write. I like to have people play the music that I write. I like to have people enjoy the music that I write. So I'm always looking for permissions. I'm looking for new ways of being able to get performances and, and all this stuff. Uh, and I'm looking for different ways of being able to develop or market my music. And this is where I started to get interested in this entrepreneurship stuff. It's really interesting because uh, when we met a few months ago, it was right around the time that um, my wife and I were getting interested in all of this. So I'm sort of a newbie. To this. I'm not going to pretend as though I'm a great font of information and I can tell you the answers to all your questions because I can't. A lot of the stuff I'm finding myself. But these are the things that I've been finding out. Specifically what I'm doing is um, I found out that as a, as a composer, um, there are two parts of being a composer. There's the composing and there's the ownership of the stuff that was composed. Now, as a film writer working on a movie or working on a TV show, you practically always work in under the conditions of what they call work for hire. Work for hire is a specific uh, part of the copyright law, which is instituted, I think, I think it was in the 70s. Uh, a lot of composers hate it. What it means is that when when you're the producer, you ask me or you ask me to write a piece for you. And I say, yes, I will. And so then we have a contract. You, the producer, then become the author, the legal author of my work, and you become the legal owner of my work, which means that not only do I not own it, I'm not even the person who literally was the creator of it, right? It doesn't matter, because all the ownership goes to the producer, and the producer has their own publishing company. How good are these publishing companies? Well, I can tell you, they're not very good at all. The publishing companies of Warner Brothers and Disney and Universal, they're great if you're a songwriter and you happen to, to have crawled your way to the top and you have a record company behind you and, and you're having people and managers and all that kind of stuff do things for you. As a publisher there, they may be okay. But these publishing companies like Universal and like Disney and Warner Brothers, they have 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of works that they publish. How many of these things do you think get to the light of the day? And if you're one of those millions of, of composers who have one of the songs, how likely do you think it is that they're going to find your piece and they're going to market it for you? You have a band piece. You have, a, um, you have an arrangement of a song you wrote. You have a song. And you want to get it out to so-and-so. The publisher's job is to take that song, to take that music, and to try and get it performed. That's what their job is. Do they do it? No, they don't. Why don't they do it? Are they a bunch of bums? Eh, maybe, you know, some of them are. Um, but let's just say that, that, that they're hard-working publishers, because a lot of them are hard-working publishers, and they try to do their best. They just have too much stuff. So there you are. You're not getting heard. You're not getting performed. What do you do? Well, you know, you have some options. You can get to be really good friends with your publisher, and you can, you know, go on the road, or you might get a manager, or you might get an attorney. You might do all sorts of kind of stuff. Or you might do the thing that I'm doing, and that a lot of other composers are doing, we're trying to self-publish. We're saying to the publishers, you know, thank you very much for what you've done, but uh, it's not really a good deal for me. In fact, about two weeks ago, I, my wife and I were in Fort Worth uh, attending the American Bandmasters Association. Now, why did I attend the American Bandmasters Association? I'm really not a bandmaster. Uh, I've written some works for band, uh, but I don't have any desire to be a bandmaster. Um, but I do have a desire to have my band works performed. So I thought, well, I'll join this association and I'll meet a lot of people and uh, endear myself to them, or maybe have my music performed. Maybe it'll help my career. Yeah, who knows? So along the line, that, as a matter of fact, has turned out to be a good deal. Um, but this last time, I'm walking through the hotel on the way to some meeting, and there's a guy there that I recognize. He actually owns the publishing company of, he, he owns a very large publishing company of a lot of classical music. Somebody who publishes me. And I have met him before, so I reintroduced myself to him when we were talking. And then he said to me uh, at one point, he um, says, you know, I'm a little ticked off with you because you went with so-and-so other publisher. And I said, oh, sort of. I went with this other publisher as a distributor. I said, but here's the thing. Here's, I, here's what I'm really trying to do. I'm trying to self-publish. I'm trying to publish my works myself. Because here's the problem I have with you and your company and other companies like you. And most other companies are like him. And he's not a bad company. He's got a great company. He's got a big company. I said, the problem is, you publish, you print my work, you get my work out there, and you only give me 10%. You set the prices on my work. Now, I said, in your publishing company, I have a piece that gets played a lot, that gets a lot of performances, and it still is being bought. I have a, a tuba concerto that I wrote 35 years ago, 40 years ago for a friend. That, that I've been told is probably the most played tuba piece on college recitals. It gets played all the time. And I get statements from the publisher that show me that they've had 150 sales of my piece, you know, but they sell it for something like $15. So what do I get? I get a dollar and a half. Every time they sell something, I get a dollar and a half. So you see this long list. I mean, literally, it's a list like this with all these, all these purchases, and I have enough to maybe take my wife to dinner at a place that's not that great, okay? This is a really popular piece. This is what we want. We want popular pieces. If I walk into a band room in some university, this university or some other place, and one of the, and the tuba player happens to recognize me, I can almost guarantee that I'm going to hear my tuba concerto play. Because he's, oh, there's the guy. Or if it's a horn player, they'll play silver oil. Because they recognize me from, from doing that kind of stuff. So it's a famous piece. But I'm not making any money on it. And frankly, as a composer, I want to make some money, you know. That's what we're here for, right? Well, that's not what we're here for, but that's part of what we want to do while we're here. So I told him all this kind of stuff, and it was, you know, it was kind of direct. I wasn't being nasty to him, and, and his response was, well, you're right. <laughs> he, takes 10, he, he takes 90%. I get 10%. Then the question comes, what about marketing? How good is his marketing? Well, he has thousands of titles, and he could be any number of one of these publishers that I've been talking about. He has thousands of titles. How likely is it that even on a piece that's moving well, he's going to particularly take that one out and push it? Well, actually, they don't. They rely upon word of mouth. Publishers are kind of lazy, like the rest of us are. They don't always do the work, but they specifically don't do the work for you 
unless they have some sort of great investment in it. And the money they're going to make off of you probably is not going to be enough for them to change their entire publishing plan. So it made more sense to me and to a lot of my friends to take this on my own. So I've been learning about self-publishing. And for that reason, I've become interested in entrepreneurship. I've been interested in learning how to make a company. Recently, um, I changed assistants. The lady who'd been working for me for years was a very nice lady. She was very good at making uh, hotel reservations, but she wasn't too good about doing anything that helped me with publishing other than being able to print music. So I've just recently started up with somebody who has some experience in music, who has some experience in marketing, who has some experience in business, and he reads music. He's actually a musician. And we sit together and we have meetings, and we're, what we're trying to do actually at this point is put together the structure of what we have. Part of it uh, involves revising the website, which needs to be um, redone. It's being redone so that it will be able to take, um, so it'll be sort of like a marketplace. You can buy things online. You can hear things online. Uh, you can come to my, my website as part of the publishing and be able to actually find pieces. The things that we're working on now are ways of marketing that we can do because we're kind of lean and mean. We don't have to rely upon G. Shermer or, or Kalmus or, or Alfred Music or whatever this, you know, to put our works in some catalog. We can go directly. We can actually go person to person in the kind of thing that we're doing. So I'm trying to make this, you know, it, it's tiring. It's really tiring. And sometimes it's kind of overwhelming because you realize there's so much stuff to do that it is just basically, uh, it's like simple accounting. Um, unless you get this stuff done, you can't get to this part. And, and until that part gets done, you can't get to this part. So a lot of it is just kind of like crawling to the finish line until we can get some very basic things finished. In the, in the process, I do a lot of reading. And I read um, some entrepreneur things. Um, I get advice. I try to get a positive mental attitude in the morning and try to keep it through the end of the day. And some of the things I've come up with have been, you know, they haven't been life shattering. They've, they've just been things that make a lot of sense. Uh, I was watching a YouTube video the other day of uh, Elon Musk, and uh, he has, there's lots of YouTube, uh, YouTube things about Elon Musk, um, mainly because he's rich and he's good looking and he's famous. So people make a lot of YouTube things on him, you know, that's kind of dumb. Um, and so one of the guys interviewing him says, gee, starting a new business, that, that must be a, a lot of fun. And Musk looks at him and says, fun? Well, no, not really, it's hard, you know. Um, and he says, well, there must be some exciting things. You're starting a new company and you've got these properties. Yeah, he says, sometimes it's exciting. At the beginning it's exciting, but pretty soon it's not exciting, it's just hard work. It's just a lot of hard work. Well, that's not very sexy, but it's Elon Musk. This is the guy who's making rockets to go to, go to Mars, you know. So what is he saying? He's saying, yes, I'm doing it, but I'm not always having a good time. I'm solving problems. There are things that we're doing that don't work. There are products that we put out that people don't buy, or they, they don't buy them to the extent that I would like them to buy. He's just talking about real life. He's, he talks a little bit about his failures. Well, let me talk to you about failures. We all have failures. Um, as a composer, you're failing all the time. You're failing in the very act of composing. I had a teacher who told me, and, and I didn't even understand what he was talking about at the time when he said this. He said, the best part of the pencil is the eraser. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, that's nice. But it didn't mean anything to me until I started to write. So you write music, and you go, uh, I don't like that part, so you erase that part. And then you write a little bit, you know, you know. and sometimes I'd write whole pages because I didn't like it. And I found out that the more erasing I did, the more writing I did. But I had to erase a lot because I was making mistakes. I was not going where I wanted to go. Or the things that I was coming up with didn't make any sense. It's the same thing in life, right? The most important part of your life's pencil is your life's eraser. You've got to start over again. You've got to correct, your, correct where you're going. In the years that I've been working as a composer, uh, when I first began working um, out of college, I was working for CBS television as part of management. I wasn't working as a composer. Uh, I was working as a music supervisor. I eventually became the manager of the music department. I was a lousy manager. And because of that, I decided to really go into something that I really enjoyed, which was composing. But as a manager, people would come in and they would talk to me. And, and I had a little bit to do with hiring, not a lot, but something to do with hiring. And people would come in and they would ask me advice. 
And the question that I got most often from young composers trying to get into television or trying to get into film was, um, would it be a good idea if I tried to be a copyist and I could work in that way? And I would say to them, well, being a copyist is a, you know, it's, it's an okay job, it's a necessary job, it's a well-paying job, it's a union job. You can make a lot of money being a copyist, or at least you can make a living being a copyist, but once you make a living at it, you probably won't want to give it up to become a composer. So finding a copyist job is difficult. Finding a composing job is difficult. So instead of being difficult to find a job you don't really want, why don't you stand in line, of the, the difficult line, for the job that you actually do want? And stand in the composing line rather than the copying line. If you want to be a copyist, that's fine. If you want to be an arranger, fine. If you want to be an orchestrator, that's fine. They're all really decent things to do. But if you want to be a composer, stand in the composing line. And what I mean by this is that I found that a lot of people were not, and I still find this, I find that a lot of people are not very clear on what their goals are. Where you are right now, since you're still in university, this is not a terrible thing. This is a great time when you get to, to look out to, the, to your life in front of you and say, I have all these interests, or maybe I only have two interests, or maybe I only have one, or I'm not sure that I have any. I need to find the thing that floats my boat. You know, you, you have all that opportunity to do it. Eventually, you will come down to a couple of ideas of the things that you find are going to be interesting. Follow them. Because whatever job you take is going to be hard. Being a composer is hard. I was telling somebody yesterday, being a compo composer sometimes is like just beating your head against the wall. I mean, things just don't work the way they're supposed to, or they, they don't come easily, or, or you can't get to your deadline the way you want, or whatever it is. But sometimes being a composer is really, really hard work. Sometimes it's a piece of cake, like Elon Musk. Sometimes it's fun. A lot is just hard work. So whatever job you take, it's going to be a hard work. You're going to have problems. You're going to have failures. Be grateful for the failures. That's just one less thing that you have to try and do uh, again in the future. Um, another thing I found to be very important for me and to be important for other people is to take responsibility for everything you do. Don't feel victimized. It's really easy to feel like you're the victim when things aren't working for you. Somebody doesn't like me. Somebody gave me a bad grade. Somebody didn't take my music. Somebody didn't uh, play my piece right. Somebody didn't blah, 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 blah. Well, somebody actually you have to blame is you. Because whatever the, whatever the thing that went wrong, basically you're at, the, you're at the middle of it. And once you can start taking responsibility for the things that work well for you, as well as for the things that don't work well for you, I think you're on the road to really great empowerment. Um, I think those are mostly the things Thank that you. I, this is awesome. I'm talking it's about. Great but, um, all I can tell you is that at, at my age now, I'm sort of in the same position as a lot of you are. Uh, the, the thing that I'm working on with this publishing, and also tr still trying to get commissions and trying to get performances and trying to find my way out of it. Uh, this is a second kind of a life for me. My first life was doing commercial music. Um, I'm not so interested in that anymore. I'm interested in this other thing. Uh, I like to teach. Um, do I want to do it full time? No, I don't, but I like doing it. Um, it helps me. I help, uh, I, I learn things from uh, seeing things of students and, and young people. Um, but I want to put that all into this life that I've got going right now because, you know, frankly, we're all living longer than we used to live. And um, it could be uh, many years before I consider retiring for real. And in the meantime, I've got lots of goals. <laughs> I've got lots of stuff I plan to do. My wife's the same way. Uh, my wife is a violinist. She plays in the movies. She's a concert master. She's one of the two top concert masters in Los Angeles. She plays for um, a, a lot of big movies. The way that she deals with it isn't just a matter of what position is she playing on on what string. Um, she knows how to get the sound. She knows how to work with a violin section. She knows how to work with a string section. She finds herself working with the composer. She finds herself working with the conductor. She finds herself working with the directors. She was working on a movie a couple of months ago. Um, I can never remember what this movie is. I went out, it's the, the latest St Steven Spielberg movie. And she's playing, and the conductor's right up there. The conductor and the composer, Al Silvestri, was up there. And Stephen's sitting right there. She's sitting and playing, and Stephen's sitting right there so he can be close to the, to the conductor. But he's also got his video camera, so video, he's kind of geeky, you know? He's making a little film of this recording session, all that kind of stuff. So she's interacting with the director. Now, she's had, she's had times when, after performing a piece on a movie, 
um, she joins the composer and the director in the recording booth, and they're talking about the cue that they just recorded and how they can massage it to make it even better um, to get the sound. And the, director, and the director sometimes says, well, the sound there isn't quite right. I, I need something that sounds more like, you know. So one day she came home, she said, I invented the sound today. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I was standing in the booth with the director and he was talking to the composer and he says, I need a sound that's kind of like, yeah. And, and she said, I took my violin, I said, you mean something like this? He said, yeah, yeah, like that, I want that. And so I, she said, I went out to the violin section and told him how to do that. He says, that's my sound, I invented my sound. So she's found ways of, of um, she's not, I wouldn't say that she's so much entrepreneurship, except that she's very careful about her own work and her own business, but she's found ways of being able to expand the uh, tradition of being a violinist. You know, um, a lot of you who are violinists or who are performers won't be called on to do that. But I'm giving this story because even as performers, uh, you have lots of options in your life. There's lots of ways of being able to play music. There's lots of ways of getting music to people. Um, just think of what's happened in the last 10 years, or actually the last 30 or 40 years. When I was a kid, um, we, we did everything on vinyl. Actually, when I was a kid, I don't think it was even vinyl yet. There were records that if you dropped, they broke. Um, but they eventually it went to, to uh, long playing records on, on vinyl, and then it went to um, cassette tapes. It went to tape, quarter inch tape, all that kind of stuff. It went to cassette tapes, it went to eight track tapes, and then it went to CDs. And even CDs are hard to find these days. So I think this stuff moves fast. What does that mean? That means there are lots of different ways now of being able to get your music out there. And I'm looking at that as well in my new life as a uh, would be publisher my own music. Um, the other great thing about being a self-publisher is that um, you like the people you're working with because basically you're just dealing with your own music. <laughs> and you're very self-protective, you know, over your product. So anyway, that's, that's most of my spiel, the stuff I have to offer you today. And if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to fake an answer. So why don't we just, thank you. Why don't we just start with some questions from all of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what did you think your career was going to be like when you were in your 20s? In my 20s? That's a really interesting question. Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. It, when I was in my 20s, um, my models Well, first of all, the thing that was available that I thought I was going to get into were either motion pictures or television, because that was all there was. Um, television at that time was run by the three major networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. So to work on television meant to work on prime time television, something that started around 8 o'clock and probably went until 11 o'clock. Um, to work on a movie, movies were pretty common, as they are now. And that was basically it. So my, the, the people I looked up to were people who did that kind of work. I was working at CBS, so I was doing primarily a lot of television. And I came in contact with a lot of television composers, a lot of guys who you've never heard of, but who were very skilled. Um, and then CBS at that time started producing motion pictures, so I started meeting some of the motion picture writers. So I, my models at the time were guys that I had met, uh, whose music I really liked. Um, like Jerry Goldsmith, Lawrence Rosenthal, um, Lalo Schifrin, Michel Legrand, Henry Mancini, guys like this. I mean, I actually came in contact with them. I could get on their sessions and watch them. And, I, and so I was thinking, boy, and if I could just do that, I could just do that. And I remember, I remember how painful it was um, walking up to the conductor stand before a session or during a session, doing something, interacting as part of the management, as part of the management team with the conductor knowing that he was conducting his own music in front of this big orchestra, and that was really what I wanted to do. But I'm, I'm two feet from him, I'm three feet from him, I'm everywhere except on the stand doing what he wanted to do. So I would guess that my ambition at that time was to do that. I wanted to be on the stand and I wanted to start conducting. So eventually I did. I got into television, I got into it slowly, working at CBS, and then when I left CBS I went into it full time. Um, when I went into it full time, the scary part was that now I was going to be hired as a composer. 
and I'd never been hired solely as a composer. I never made a living solely as a composer. I, I was like, you know, sink or float. Um, and I was lucky. I got, I got busy very quickly. So I, now I've had a career as being a television composer. Okay, so part of that, part of that, I wouldn't call it a dream because I don't think I really had any dreams. Um, I don't think I'd actually, I don't think I was even that far along to tell you the truth. Um, you know, when, when you get to be my age, one of the things you think about is if I knew then what I know now, so if I knew then what I know now, I, I would have done things differently. But so now I was doing TV. And pretty soon I was, um, I was winning Emmys, or I was getting Emmy nominations. So, so I'm doing really well on TV. And I, I was, you know, and eventually I got into, into movies and all that kind of stuff. At some point, maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, I looked back. It wasn't that I was looking ahead as to what I wanted to do. I was looking back on all the stuff that I had done. And in that was a whole bunch of surprises. I, I would say looking back on my career for the last 50 years, because it's been about 50 years, um, has just been full of surprises. Things that I never thought I would do. Um, writing music that I never thought that I would ever be good enough to write. Understanding things that I never thought I would understand. A lot of the confusion of, of being young um, dissipated by just doing stuff a lot. Making mistakes, correcting mistakes, having some successes, having a lot of failures. Uh, having a lot of disappointments, and there have been a lot of disappointments. Um, but somewhere, I mean, after all, I mean, you, you just find that your life takes this, is, is this like, I, I don't want to sound stupid here because it, it, uh, it's really easy to say, keep a positive mental attitude and accentuate the positive and blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is true, but um, looking back, I realized all the things that happened that I would never have guessed were going to happen to me looking forward. And I say, I, I guess if I had one thing that I would do differently, if I could and I couldn't, would be that if I had the sense then that I have now, I would have aimed higher. I think that's probably, I think that's one thing I have to remind myself even now, even at my age, I've got to aim high. If I don't aim high, I, life is just going to happen. Uh, I'm reading a book, um, about, um, well, it doesn't matter. Right? Right? One of the things that they made, he was talking about wealth in the, uh, in the, in the world. And um, one, of the, one of the things that's like a duh comment is you don't have to do anything to be poor. You have to do something to, be, to create wealth. So if you don't do anything, stuff is going to happen anyway. But if, if your goal is to be poor, and nobody has a goal to be poor, you really don't have to do anything. You can just be the way you are because Nothing's going to happen, you know. But if you want something to happen, you've got to work at it. So my thing these days is just to aim high and um, set my goals really high because I know what the goals are when I'm really low. Um, I guess my answer to your question is I don't think I had a lot of goals. I don't think I had a lot I was looking forward to. I was looking forward to uh, supporting my family. I was married at the time. I had a little girl. I just wanted to make enough money to be able to support the family and be able to pay the mortgage. And when I found I could do that, I felt, you know, I felt pretty good. And I really hadn't thought much beyond that. Now I think a lot farther than that. You know? and, um, and frankly, this stuff is, you know, this, like somebody said the other day, it's not rocket surgery. You know? um, it isn't rocket science. A lot of this stuff is just, duh. Like one of the guys I like to read is Grant Cardone. You know Grant Cardone. Uh, I mean, he's a, like a crazy person, salesperson. Um, but the thing I like about him mostly is that the things that he talks about are just common sense. Like he says, don't compete, dominate. What does he mean by that? If you're, if you're busy trying to do what somebody else is doing or try to better somebody else, you're wasting your time. If you're so busy with stuff, you've dominated your area with so much activity, it's gonna be hard for anybody to compete with you. You've got, and you've got lots of options. The reason, the reason nothing is happening for you is because nobody knows who you are. Well, that's, that, one, that one kind of comes really close to home, you know? Well, but I've been working hard. I've been practicing. My mother thinks I'm a genius. You know, all these kinds of things happen. You go, oh, but, but, and, but the truth is, nobody knows who you are. So the reason they're not buying your product is because you haven't put it out to sale to enough people. You, by the way, are your product. 
You are your service. And I have to tell you, if you people are all, I'm assuming you're all music, uh, music students, music majors, this is a great product. This is a great product, a great underestimated product. You can't do anything more better for the world than to be a musician. But it's going to be useless if you don't get the friggin' product out there to people who need it. And each of you have a different version of the product. Um, I was, just before we came in here, I was listening to a, a group um, practice. Uh, it sounded like Mozart, clarinet and violin and, and piano. It's a really pretty piece. Okay, Mozart, Mozart gets sold in the first time. But I'm listening to the music, and I'm listening to the way the music's played, and I'm thinking, gee, that's really interesting. I really like the way that was done and the way that was done. That's a product that I'm listing I can't make a lot of use of. If these people knew what they had, they would go out and they would refine their product so that other people, like me, could go out and maybe buy it on a recording or maybe go to a performance or maybe find some other way of being able to get it. You are the product. Why wouldn't you treat it well? You know? why, wouldn't you, why wouldn't you think big thoughts about how to get that product out there? Because if your product, you, does well, you're going to do well because you are the product. And you know, it's not that hard to do. Well, it is that hard to do. I take it back. It is that hard to do. You have to work at it. And if you don't constantly work at it, you'll keep sliding back. It's like when I was in high school, I was trying to study German. And um, one of the things, I've been trying to study German all my life. Um, one of the things my, my teacher said was in foreign languages, um, you can't stay at the same level. If you're learning a foreign language, you can't just learn it and then walk away from it. You have to keep practicing it because if you don't practice it, it'll get worse. So I have a friend who uh, uh, was born in Tucson, an Italian family. And she's you know pretty normal American, but years, she's a singer. And she decided years ago to go to Germany. <coughs> and she's very good at meeting people, so pretty soon she got into a, a good group of people. But she didn't learn to speak German before she went. And so she learned. German on the streets. Her German is disgusting. I mean, I hear her German and I, I flinch because her, her grammar is terrible, her vocabulary is awful, but she's quite fluent. And she has no problem having anybody understand anything she's gonna say. Anyway, so she's fluent in this kind of crappy German and she writes me emails every once in a while. Her English is worse than her German because she doesn't use her English, right? I mean, she's an American-born girl for Pete's sake. She didn't go to Germany until she was in her 30s. She's American born, but she doesn't use English. Her English, she's, she writes English like she picked it up as a German. She writes German English. It's goofy. It's really weird. The point is, if you don't keep it, you'll lose it. So in your career, in your product, in your sales, in, in thinking about yourself, in whatever your dreams are, dream a little higher. In fact, dream a lot higher. You know, um, dream a lot higher, really. Work a little harder. Work a lot harder, actually. Just work a lot harder. Don't be afraid of erasing your ideas. That's okay, but then just go back and do them again. Do them over again. I recently, I'm working on a piece now, it's a commission for a trombone player and band. It has four movements. And um, in television and film, you never rewrite anything. Or, or, well, you do when somebody tells you they, they hate it and you have to rewrite it. Um, but basically when you write, rewrite it, it has to be done on Tuesday at eight o'clock, so you got it done by then. But when you're doing a concert work, it's not quite like that. You have deadlines, but it's not really quite as bad as it is in commercial work. So um, I wrote this piece, and I'm now in the point of orchestrating everything and, and uh, making sure the balances are correct. So on, uh, I have it in Sibelius. So on Sibelius, I just played through the MIDI. It's pretty, you know, pretty crude, but I couldn't hear what it was. And I got to the third movement, and I thought, after I played it, I thought, this piece sucks. <laughs> The other three are pretty good. <laughs> this one sucks. And I'm thinking, okay, so I should go back and I should work on it again. And I thought, no, I should throw this one away. <laughs> so I threw it away and I wrote another one. So the other day I finished that one and I was listening to it and I thought, okay, this doesn't suck as much, um, but it still needs to be reworked. So I'm going to go back. I mean, so this piece still, of my four movements, this piece is still, as far as I'm concerned, a failure. Now, I could let it out, and people would say, oh, that's nice, because I've heard pieces much worse than this one get out by other people, but that's not my standard. You know, that's not what I want to do. I want this piece to be as good as I can. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to take a look at it, I'm going to rewrite it. And in doing that, I was um, convinced to do this 
by remembering that um, the version of Romeo and Juliet that we hear by Tchaikovsky, you know, dee da 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 The version that we all hear, that's not the original version. There are, I think, two other versions of Romeo and Juliet, and, if you, and you can actually hear recordings of them. If you hear the recording of the version that was written right before the one that we know, it's very, very different. The tunes are still there. The themes are still there. The, the, the phrases are still there, but they're very, very different. And frankly, it's not as good as the one that he ended up with. So he went back and he rewrote it. Uh, I was listening to the Walton um, First Symphony in the last couple of days, and I got the score out to see some things. And in the front page of the score, it talked about uh, how he wrote the piece and how long it took. It was over a year that he was working on the piece, and he had three movements finished out of four. And so they performed the three movements, but he still had to write the fourth one. It took almost two years to write this friggin' piece. And I'm thinking, well, obviously he did a lot of erasing because he couldn't come up with the material that he wanted. He kept pushing, 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 pushing. Well, the piece that he has now is a pretty good piece. You know, it was worth spending two years on it. So if it takes you two years, take two years. If it takes you two months, lucky you. Some things just take, you know, a couple of minutes. But just do it. I mean, I, I can't say anything more about this than shoot high and just do it. Just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Tell people you're doing it. Get partners. You need partners. You need people to be objective about it. You need people to help you with your problems. Um, but just do it. If you don't do it, it's like poor. You don't have to do anything to become poor. That's where you'll be. That was my second. <laughs> okay, that's it. On. Do you have more questions? Yeah, that was an answer to one question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, how did it what? When you score Heart of Darkness, how did it come about that you would use a live orchestra? How did it come about that I... You would use a live orchestra. Oh, a live orchestra. Oh, because that's what they wanted. Um, the guys who produced that were a French, a French group. Um, it was actually, it was a, talking about things in the future, it was something that I could never have predicted. Um, they were based in Paris and I was based in L.A. So we used to go back and forth and see each other all the time. And I'd drive, I'd drive, I'd fly to Paris, and sometimes they'd come to LA, but more often I'd go to Paris. It was really a cool job. Um, they had seen my score to the Rescuers Down Under, and they really liked the movie, and they, they liked the style of the animation, they liked the style of the music, and they wanted to get the guy who did the Rescuers Down Under. So that was done with an orchestra, and uh, at that time, synth stuff wasn't quite as far along as it is now, so we did it with an orchestra. And, uh, and they did a movie, they, they did the animation in Heart of Darkness, they thought in a Disney style. It's not really, but it's still really well done. You know. The funny thing is I got Rescuers Down Under because I'd done Silverado. They wanted to do a, um, Rescuers Down Under was a, um, an adventure movie with no songs in it. So they wanted to get a guy who wrote adventure music and they thought of Silverado in the Western. So they asked me and see one thing gets to another thing. I mean, that's the other, you, you, you get surprises. People ask you to do things and you're surprised. It's something that you've done that you don't think anything about sticks in somebody's mind. By the way, that's, that's how that one happened. Questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, being a novice composer, I had uh, struggled asking for like, price for like, being also as a publisher. Where are some ways that makes you actually negotiate that with the people you're publishing for as well? Or what are the tactics you can do? Or what do you, how does that begin? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't do all that. Like asking for prices being now self-publishing yourself? You're talking about pricing? Yes. Are we talking about like, like, publishing things? For like self-publishing yourself. Yeah. How does that differ to where you had to rotate work for hire? Like how would you negotiate that? Well, we're work for hire? Yeah. The, the work for hire things, motion pictures and television are usually negotiated by an agent. Um, and, the, and the rates vary wild, wildly. Um, like if you were going to do a movie, if you've got a big movie right now, and let's say even if Steven Spielberg was directing it, uh, you wouldn't get what John Williams gets. You know. um, and chances are you wouldn't be working with Steven Spielberg, so you'd get even less. <laughs> you know. Although, you know, he might just try and get you for nothing. Um, they're usually negotiated by the agents over some agreed upon minimum. Uh, maybe what your past performance was. Um, the agents will try and get you a raise. Or if it's in television, there are some standards on television, and then you know, you'll you know, do it like that. When you're doing um, when you're doing your own stuff, um, like on the publishing, 
the way I set rates in the publishing is basically I, I go through a lot of pieces that are similar in many different publishers to see what they're selling for because I don't want to overprice it, but I don't want to underprice it. I'm still working that, that part out. <coughs> Pricing's hard. The reason people have agents is because the agents can treat you objectively, whether, while you'll always be subjective about price. Um, most composers are underpaid. Even composers who make a lot of money doing commissions and things, they're mostly underpaid given how much work they do. Uh, I wish I could get paid a nickel a note and it, it come along the lines of what I should actually get paid, you know. But uh, if you have somebody else negotiating for you, your chances of getting more money are improved. However, they're going to take a piece of it. So I had an agent one time who was a, who was a good agent. But personally, he was a sleazebag, but he was a good agent. And he said to me one time, he said, you will never feel my commission. Meaning that he would always get me as much money as he could, and that his commission would, wouldn't be a dent into my salary. And, and actually, he was good at it. He was really good at it. But he was very obnoxious in doing it. Um, How does one go about finding an agent? How important is that in today's world for well, agents, agents work like this. What, what agents are supposed to do is agents are supposed to find you work. Uh, like publishers are supposed to print your music and sell your music, but they don't. Uh, sometimes they do. Um, basically what they do is they work with who you know. So if you're a young composer, maybe one of you, maybe two of you are going to try to go to Los Angeles or New York and try and get into the movie business, whatever it is. And one of the things you're going to be thinking about is maybe I should get an agent to help me out. No, they won't help you out. What they do is they'll ask you who you know. They'll ask you who you've worked with. They'll ask you what producers you know, what directors you're friendly with. And if your answer is, well, I haven't met any yet, it's like, well, come back and see us in a few years when you've got some, some friends, some people to talk to. Because what they will do is they will, they will get your name out primarily to the people who know you, who are already ready to use you. And those are the people, they, they will look and see when those people are working, <coughs> when they have a movie coming up, when they've just been sold a series, and they will try to, to put you together with that person. But they will put you together with that person along with several other clients. So no agent, or very few agents, practically no one, will just bring you up and you alone. They'll be negotiating for a lot of people. Because to them, it's 10% or 15%. Uh, if you make, if, if make $10,000 and they make 10%, they make $1,000. If the other client they have going for the same job makes $10,000, they're still making $1,000, so they don't really care whether it's you or the other guy. You know? um, I've even had cases where the agent was negotiating against me wow. on my own project, which was hurtful. Um, but th I mean, those things happen. So grow up, learn about agents. Um, you, uh, agents are very good for, uh, to be crude for keeping your hands clean. If there's something you want, um, one of the great things about agents is that they are marked as business people. You're not. You're a creative person. Creative people aren't supposed to know anything about business. They're not supposed to be good at business. Well, this class is trying to put the lie to that. But you can still all play dumb. You know, get somebody else to be the, you, you need an attorney. You need somebody who can make a deal with you. And then the thing is that they can be objective. They can, they can actually get you more money. Like attorneys, what they will do is they will go through your contract. And they will go through all these deal points, which you may go through, you may understand them all, and they may be perfectly fine for you. But the attorney knows that if you do this one, that's going to cost you some money. Or if you take that out and put this in instead, you'll make more money if such and such occurs. So, I mean, attorneys can, can do you a lot of good, too. But attorneys are expensive. So I wouldn't advise anybody trying to get an agent or an attorney until you really need them. In other words, would you recommend trying to build their own careers on their own and to develop their relationships on their own and once they're what? too full to handle it, then they can get the agents. Yeah, or if you really need to make a deal, get an attorney. Right. Or even get an agent. A lot of agents will work on a, on a one-time basis. You know, they'll just make a single one-off deal. Um, a piece of advice that an attorney told me, um, gave me when I was looking for an attorney, he said, ask him how much he charges. <laughs> now, that sounds really stupid. But a lot of us get kind of funny around money. Not attorneys, you know. So ask an attorney, how, what's, your, what's your rate? Um, for example, on this publishing thing, I was talking to an attorney. I had some questions for the attorney. He was not somebody I'd worked with before, but I knew him and he knew me. Uh, as it turned out, he, was, he had just 
retire. So he, he, he was going to do some work for me if I really needed it. And he said, my rate is $450 an hour. OK, that's pretty steep, $450 an hour. There's another attorney I have who's $750 an hour. So this guy's sort of a deal. you know. Um, but there was another guy I'd been talking to who has a lot of experience. He used to work for a publishing company, has a lot of experience in it, is not retired, and can solve all my problems. And he's $50 an hour cheaper. So if I have some questions, I'll go talk to him. But I won't give him a lot of questions because I don't want to spend a lot of hours. You know, I don't want to be on the phone or have him doing a lot of paperwork at that rate. So, but, but I do need an attorney to be able to solve certain problems. Okay, time for one more question before we're done. So. Yep. Uh, I have a question about, so as uh, young people, <coughs> we are still at the same period. So we maybe we still have to think about develop our career. So we are still like considering um, how can we decide our major. I'm not the oracle at Delphi, so anything I tell you is just my opinion. Um, I would say go with what you know right now. I would say probably, in th the good chances are that in 10 years, all of you are going to be doing something slightly different than what you think you're going to be doing right now. So if you have a major that is something that's really interesting to you, do it. Take it. You know, If, if you think it's going to get you into such and such a career, if it's the best ma major that matches that career dream, it sounds like a good idea. But if you're going into a career um, that is going to be very different from your major, that makes no sense. Uh, unless, you're, unless you're a musician and part of your major is business, which makes a lot of sense. I, mean, my, I don't know if I'm being clear on this. I mean, it's like, if you're, if you're a performer um, and your major is composition, you've probably got the wrong major. Uh, if, you're a, if you know that you're going to be some sort of a performer in your life, that you're working to be a performer, musician, um, don't take, um, I don't know, don't take natural science. I mean, you know, I mean take something that's related to, to what you actually want to do. But I can just guarantee you that whatever you want to do, whatever your career choices are now, are going to modify in the next few years because you're going to have opportunities to do things that you don't have right now that you can't see. Things are going to happen. Does that help? Is that sort of what you're talking about? I mean, there, there's, no, there's, there's no sure thing. There's no sure thing. You can't, um, I mean, that's the thing. There's, there's no sure thing, which means, that doesn't mean that everything that's going to happen is going to happen badly. That means there's going to be a lot of good things. You're going to get a lot of surprises. A lot of them are going to be a lot of good things. They're going to be very cool surprises. You're going to get some surprises that aren't so cool. That just happens. But um, you know, leave, leave yourself open for things to happen. But um, I don't know. I mean, my, my major at school was uh, music composition. I, I took a degree at USC. Uh, the reason I went into composition was because I couldn't think of anything else to do. I never wanted to be a composer. I mean, I never didn't want to be a composer, but I just never planned to be a composer. I became a composer because um, I couldn't think of another major to have. I was already pretty musical. I was a good pianist. I didn't want to study piano anymore. And I didn't have any other interest in music other than composition. I didn't know very much about it. So I became a composer. And then um, with a composing degree, I had to figure out what I was going to do with it because I was not qualified to do anything else. And I didn't have any interest to be anything else. So I was a composer. You know? And I finally decided to go into, to go into movies to write music that meant something to people, that I could affect people. And that, and that started this whole thing, you know. But as a composer, I had lots of friends who I was in school with. They were composers, too. Some of them ended up being um, academics. Some of them ended up being uh, salespeople for non-musical projects. Uh, some people ended up being uh, managers of music companies. I mean, you know, there were all sorts of versions of that. And some of them didn't write, don't write music anymore. But they, we all graduated in the same year. The same, with the same major. Your life's going to go in different ways. I, mean, I can guarantee that. Thank you very much, Bruce, for joining us. Today.
Thank you.